Hello, welcome to Tabletop CP. Today I'll be continuing the series on infantry and chain of command. In today's video, I'm going to be covering some of the basic game mechanics related to infantry as well as some infantry tactics. So I've set up this little scenario just for this video. And we see a German platoon minus attempting to cross this field through these two squads of allied soldiers and capture the crossroads. So I've been trying to figure out how to do this for a while now and I've tried a few different ways out. I've tried you know, one squad versus one squad which doesn't work very well. I've tried two squads versus one squad which works okay. And I've tried this one with three squads plus some extras against two squads. I found this probably the best setup for this. Uh, it gives me the most uh, options and the most chances to show multiple things occurring and different ways to use the order dice and different ways to use different tactics. So that's what we're going to do. So over here we have a German platoon. Let's go over it real quick. Got one squad there. Another squad here who will be trying to advance across the field. And also in this squad is a senior leader, platoon sergeant. Over here we have another squad. They will be advancing over this hedge and hopefully over that wall just to show a little bit of the uh, differences in movement. And I also have the 5 centimeter mortar with two crew and a MG34 on a tripod with five crew and another senior leader, the platoon leader, the lieutenant. So on this side we have a squad or a section of uh, 51st Scottish Highland Division. So it's a six-man rifle team, a junior leader, and a three-man Bren team. We also have a senior leader. Then we have a French section, which consists of a MG section with two crew, four rifles, a junior leader, and then a four-man rifle team. So as part of the basic game mechanics, I like to talk about the different levels of cover in this game. So there's three different levels. There's the open, which obviously is the big open areas. There's light cover, which is these hedges, which could be light woods, orchards, hedges, things like that. And there's hard cover, which would be things like rock walls, stone buildings, or bunkers. So when you're hit by enemy fire in chain of command, there's two things that can happen to you. You can take some shock, or you could lose a man outright. And what cover does is it modifies the roll to see what happens to you. So if you're in the open, it's far easier to hit, wound, and kill uh, the target. So in this case, on a 3 plus, something bad will happen to you. 3, 4, you'll take a shock. 5, 6, you'll be killed. Uh, in light cover, it'll be a 4 or a 5, you'll, be, you'll take some shock. And a 6, you'll take a kill. And then hard cover, it'll be a shock on a 5 and a kill on a 6. So the harder the cover, the harder it is to, to damage the target unit. So losing a man is bad, but getting shock can be just as bad. So the way shock works in this game is it limits the effectiveness of your squad over time. So the more shock you take, the less effective that squad is going to be. And what shock will do is it will slow you down. So every point of shock you have will be one pip less of movement on the squad. And that's cumulative. So however much shock is accumulated between both teams, that's how much less you're going to be able to move uh, when you try to move. Shock also affects shooting. So for every two points of shock a team has, you lose one shot. And eventually, when you get more shock than men in the squad, you become pinned. When you become pinned, you can no longer move, and you can only fire at half effect. When you have twice the amount or more of shock as men in the squad, you break. And when you break, you literally run off. So if this squad here broke, they would run 2d6 plus 6 back this way, facing away from the enemy, and they would stop wherever they ended and be pinned there. If the turn should end and they haven't removed enough shock to unpin themselves or just be pinned again instead of broken, which means they have don't have, I should say, as much double the shock as men, then they route. And that's a bad thing. A team breaks is a bad thing as well. Uh, correction, a team routing or a squad routing does not uh, mean a bad thing. It's only when they break. But, should a leader be attached to the squad when they route, that is definitely a bad thing. And that's one of the worst things that can happen in this game is 
a junior or senior leader routing because that tells the rest of the men hey if the officers and the NCOs are getting out of here you know, why are we still hanging around so it's a very bad thing uh, that you, you want to avoid obviously but as a tactic to use is a, uh, a very effective tactic to break a squad and then end the turn so if you can get enough pins on a squad, enough kills that they eventually have double the shock as men, the team will break. And if you use a chain of command dice, if you have one, you can end the turn. And then any leaders attached to that squad will be rolling bad things. And chain of command is primarily a game about force morale. So the more force morale uh, bad things you can force the enemy to roll on, the better. And one of the best things, or the easiest ways to drop force morale is to force leaders to rout. That is, well, basically the worst thing that can happen in this game. So moving on, uh, leaders. So we got two types of leaders. We have a senior leader and a junior leader. So a senior leader, uh, there's two of them in this platoon. Uh, this one here, for example, will be a lieutenant. And then we have the platoon sergeant over here with the submachine gun. Um, all senior leaders, well not all, there are some uh, exceptions, but generally all senior leaders have three command initiatives and a nine inch command range. So each command initiative is something he can use to order a squad to do something, or he can use it to take a shock off the squad as long as he is attached to them, or as long as that squad is out of line of sight of the enemy. Junior leaders, such as the squad leader here, or a vehicle commander, or the commander of a gun team, like a Pac-40 or something, uh, they have two command initiatives with a six inch range, and they can only command their own troops. Uh, unlike the senior leader, who can command anyone in the platoon. All right, enough talk. Let's get started with the uh, scenario here. So I am gonna be using command dice for this. I did try it without command dice, activating everyone every time, but I don't think that got the point across about uh, command dice or, or obviously how to use command dice. So I will be using command dice. I'm not going to be keeping track of chain of command points, however, uh, but I will keep track of, we will do double phases because those are a huge part of this game. A double phase basically means you get to go twice in a row, which can be very powerful, especially in a situation like this, which it could completely turn the tide of the battle either way, depending on who gets the double phase. So we'll start off with the Germans. They have the initiative in the scenario. We roll the command dice. Uh, the Germans get five command dice, as do uh, the uh, allies. Let's roll them up. So we got here. So command dice wise, two sixes. That's a double phase, which is very helpful to the Germans. And then we wound up with a one and two twos. So a one can activate a team, such as the tripod mounted machine gun. A two can activate a section without the leader. So a section activating without a leader can shoot or move. A leader has to be activated on a three in order to remove shot or do any uh, special rules or put them on overwatch or go tactical. Uh, wind up with two twos. Um, but chain of command, what, one thing you can do, which is very helpful, is you, you can um, combine dice. So you can add two dice together to make something else. Uh, you can only add things up to a four. You can't make a five or a six by adding together. But you can't add uh, dice together up to a four. So in this case, I could take make two squads do something on their own. So two squads could shoot or move or I could combine both twos into a four and activate the senior leader. And he could do three things as he has three command initiatives. So it'd be more efficient to create a four and do three things instead of do two things on two twos. Uh, I could also do a two and a one to make a three to activate a junior leader. So a squad leader could activate and put a squad on overwatch. That tank could do something or a gun could do something go on overwatch. So you do have a lot of options when it comes to command dice as far as the uh, adding uh, together of dice to add, to make different command dice. So with this roll, what I'm going to do is I'm going to activate, I'm going to make a four with this, and I'm going to activate a senior leader. Now I know I get another phase because I got a uh, two sixes. 
So I do get another phase, so I get to keep that in the back of my mind that I'm going to be able to do something again. So what I want to do is I want to get these guys moving, and I want to do some shooting. So the two twos, I'm going to make a four and activate my lieutenant. He has three command initiatives. He can activate anyone in his platoon. So what I'll do is I'll activate this squad, and I'll activate this squad, and I'll activate the machine gun team to fire into the enemy line. And I have a one left. I can, act, I can use that to activate a team. So the one I could activate the mortar, or I could activate the machine gun. Or you could activate an individual team in a squad as well. So if, say, Machine Gewehr, you're going to have the junior leader activate the machine gun squad with Machine Gewehr, or Machine Gun Team, I should say, add more dice. He wouldn't be able to activate the rifles because he has to use both command initiatives to do Machine Gewehr on the machine gun. But if you have a one and you still want to shoot the rifles, you could just activate a team with the one. But in this case, I'm going to just activate the uh, two-inch mortar team, not two-inch, the five-centimeter mortar. So I'm going to activate this squad first. Now I want them to move towards the hedge. So there's different movement rates in chain of command. So this squad has a couple options here. It can move with 3d6 for a run. And you will move 3d6, but at the end of that move you're going to take a point of shock per team. That's just to uh, you know, show how they're disorganized uh, from a sprint when they get to where they're going, they're going to take a little bit of time to gather themselves and get back in quarter. Uh, you can move with two dice. That's your normal move. You just move 2d6, and that's it. You just stop where you are, and you can't shoot. Uh, you can't do anything. Uh, the Americans have some special rules, but I covered that in my last video. Or you can move with one dice, and there's two ways to move with one dice. You can move tactically. So you move 1d6, and when you get to where you're going, you take up a tactical stance, which means you're in one level of cover better than you're actually in. So if you move tactically across the open, when you stop, you'll be in soft cover. If you move tactically up to some soft cover, you'll be in hard cover. And actually, if you move tactically up to hard cover, it actually increases your, hard, your cover as well. So say you get shot by some HE and you're tactical behind cover, normally the HE would reduce the cover by one, but if you're tactical in hard cover, it negates that. So what I'll do is I'll just move this squad tactically 1d6 towards the enemy. Oh, and also if you move 1d6, um, you can move and fire at half effect. So, but we want to get moving, so we're just going to move these guys up. So that's a decent roll. So you order the entire squad to move up with one command. So both teams will go up as well as any leaders attached to them. So senior leaders can move with the squad that they're with, however far they go, and assume the same stance. Or if you want to move a senior leader on his own, he takes one command initiative, and he can move um, up to 3d6, and, and leaders ignore shock when they're by themselves. So that squad's moved up tactically. Let's add some tactical markers to them, just to show that they are tactical. So this squad down here, I want them to move now. So this is a high obstacle, and moving over obstacles um, such as this, a high obstacle, you would roll 2d6 and you remove the highest dice. And that's how far you'll move. So, so I rolled a 5 and a 2. Since it's a tall obstacle, I have to remove the highest dice. So that leaves me with a 2. So when you're up against a hedge, the way we do it, if you roll a 1, you can get over. Just to the other side. Uh, that's why it's always good to line up. If you plan on moving the squad, get everyone up against the hedge. So that way if you do roll a one, you can at least get over. If you got guys stretched all the way back, obviously you're not going to make it from here all the way over on a one. So it's a good idea if you plan on moving the squad, get them all up against the hedge if possible. So they did wind up moving two inches, which basically just gets them right over the hedge. So that was it for the first phase. Now we got a double phase, we rolled two sixes, so we get to roll our five command dice again. So she grab all five, so another double phase. So that is fortuitous. Um, two and a three and then a five. Fives are uh, chain of command points. So every five you get, keep track, and when you get up to six, uh, when you get six fives, that means you got a full chain of command dice and you can do 
various things with them, which I'm not going to go over in this video as this is an infantry video. So just ignore the five. But we did get another double phase. Um, we have a house rule here where you can only get two double phases in a row. When you start getting three double phases, it's, uh, it gets a little out of hand. So uh, we're just going to do two double phases. Um, another problem, with the, well, there is a problem with double phases in that it does limit the amount of command dice you get. So you see, I had a double phase and a chain of command point, which leaves me only with a two and a three. There's not a lot of stuff I can do with that. I've got no force, so I can't activate a senior leader. What I can do is I can activate two squads. One squad with the leader on the three, and one squad without the leader on a two. So I need to start pouring some fire on these guys. Uh, so I could use a three to fire a squad, and a two to fire a squad, or I could keep moving. Uh, what I want to do first, probably, is get these guys moving. They're in the open right now. Well, technically, if you're shooting past a, a little wall like this, they would get soft cover. But I want to get them up into the hard cover, so I'm going to use a 2 to move them, because I don't need the senior leader to move them normally. Uh, the 3, I'm going to move this squad tactically uh, up a little bit. So what we'll do is we'll roll 1d6 for them with one of his commands. So a 4. So we got a pretty good move. We made it a pretty good distance tactically so far. We haven't taken any shooting yet. So um, that's that. So this squad is going to move 2d6 and hope to get up to the wall. Actually, I'm going to move 3d6 because I want to make sure I get to that wall. So um, movement-wise, if you have a specific destination you're trying to reach, like a wall, or the edge of a building, the edge of a wheat field, um, edge of some woods, you can declare that before you roll. So I'm going to say, I'm going to move up to the wall. Now if these guys just said, I'm going to, if these guys out in the open were to say, I'm just going to run, you would have to run as far as the dice I told you to run. Without a specific destination in mind, you have to move the full distance. But since I do have a full dis uh, specific destination here, the wall, I'm going to roll 3d6, because I want to make sure I get there. So yeah, so that's 16. Obviously, I made it to the wall. Now, if I didn't declare that, I'd probably have to go 16 around here, but I did say I'm going to move up to the wall, and I want to make sure I get there. So, obviously, we'll just all move right up to the wall, like so. take one point of shock per team after the long dash to the wall we're disorganized so the next turn this leader is going to have some work to do removing some shock so this guy activated with three still actually has one command left and what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw a smoke grenade so smoke grenades as well as frags you have each leader has as many smoke or frag grenades as he has command initiatives so this leader on a three He's got two smoke grenades. He's one of his command issues to move them tactically, so he's got one left. So we're going to roll, we're going to throw one smoke grenade. So you're going to have to keep track of that uh, separately, obviously. So what you do is you just pick a, a team or a soldier that's going to throw the grenade, and it's assumed that the leader hands it to him, and he throws it. Or the leader can throw it himself, I suppose. And smoke grenades, uh, you can fire, or not fire, but you can throw it two ways, 1d6, or 2d6, depending on how far you want it to go. I want to get this thing as far as I can, so I'm going to throw it 2d6. And I'm going to throw it from this guy, actually, this guy here, that direction, towards the French. So he threw it 8 inches. So what you do is you get a, uh, you just measure 8 inches from the thrower, and you place the smoke. So the smoke from a smoke grenade is a three inch ball of smoke. And smoke grenades, how they work, they don't block line of sight, like say a two inch mortar smoke would completely block line of sight. Smoke grenades will add a negative one modifier to hit for the shooting target or anyone shooting through it, even yourself. So the way I threw that now, I have uh, some of the French squad 
is behind it, so they're going to be uh, minus one to hit. So I did get another double face, so let's jump right into that. So let's roll another. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Did, did I already have two double phases? I think so. So that time we got two fives, which I'm not keeping track of, but those are chain of command points. And I wound up with a one, a two, and a four. The fours are always good to have, especially when you have more junior leader, senior leaders, because you can do more stuff. And I have a nine inch command range with this four. So there's a couple options I have. I am in range of that squad with this senior leader. Also in range of both of these support weapons. So I could activate the mortar, I could activate the machine gun, and I could order this squad to move tactically. I am out of range of this squad, so I cannot order them with the senior leader. But with the one and the two, I can make a three, put it here, and remove both shock. So that's what I'm gonna do there. And over here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna order this squad to move, the machine gun to fire, and the light mortar to fire as well with the four. So when you're shooting past troops, you actually need a two inch gap between or past the uh, friendly unit that you're shooting past, unless it's a tank, obviously. They don't care. So what I want to do is I want to shoot at these British over here. So the machine gun does have a small gap about here that he can hit, that he can fire on um, the British section with. So I'll go ahead and fire the mortar first, and then the machine gun, and then I'll move these guys up again, tactically. First thing I'll do is I'll fire the two inch mortar team. So two inch mortar only gets two dice, uh, his HE is two, and HE does reduce cover by one. So these guys are in soft cover, but with the HE from the mortar, it's that they're actually going to be in the open. So light mortars uh, such as this with a 2 inch mortar fire in HE or 60 mil mortars in, in the uh, US Army. They will hit on a 4, 5, or 6 if the fire has line of sight to the target. But you can also fire them when they have no line of sight using line of sight of other units. But if you do that, you're only hitting on a 5 or 6. So I am within 2 inches of the hedge. And that is the visibility limit of a hedge such as this, 2 inches. So I do have direct line of fire or sight, so I'm going to fire onto them needing a force. So that's two hits. So, um, what happens now, I'll cover this now as good as time as any. When you hit a squad, as long as the two teams are within four inches of each other, or any amount of teams are within four inches of the target unit or team, you can split, split the hits up. So in this case, I targeted this squad, or section, and I got two hits. So one would go on the machine gun team, one would go on the rifle team. So now these guys are considered in the open. I will now roll as if they are in the open because of the HE from the mortar. So I'll start here on the rifle team. A two, that's nothing. And the machine gun team, a three. So that will be one point of shock, thanks to the HE effect of the mortar. So I'll just put a shock marker on them, and then we'll move on to the machine gun. So the machine gun team is going to fire at these British again. So machine gun gets 10 shots. Uh, cannot use machine gun from the senior leader there because he used his uh, other two command initiatives on other things, such as the mortar and the squad. So we're just going to fire 10 shots. So the effective range of a machine gun is 24 inches, which I know this is because I set the board up specifically for that reason. So we are within 24. So effective, if you're in close range, you're hitting on four pluses with 10 dice. If I was more than 24, I'd be in effective range. I would be hitting on five pluses. So four pluses onto this British squad. So we wound up with five hits. So when you have an, an odd number of hits, um, if the target is in the open, the firing unit can assign the odd hit. If the target is in cover, such as they are now in light cover behind this hedge, the target, uh, the player controlling the, the target, gets to allocate the odd hit. So, I have a run team with three men and a rifle team with six men. 
I want to make sure that I keep that friend team going as long as possible, so I'm going to put the odd hit on the rifle team. So they are in soft cover, so I'll roll three for the rifle team, a three and a four. So soft cover, a three is nothing, but a four is a shock. And the Bren team, a th two and a three, which is nothing in hard cover. So with the two inch mortar and the machine gun, I, want, I managed to put one point of shock on the Bren team. Not very good. The last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move this squad up with the command from the senior leader tactically again. Not sure how wise it is, but I just want to just want to keep them moving. Or I could order them to throw a smoke grenade, but I'm just going to move up, have the whole squad move tactically three inches. All right, so I moved them up three inches. So now it is the turn of the allies. So they're going to roll their five command dice. Oh, that's a great roll. I like that. So three ones, a two, and a three. So a lot of stuff I could do with that. I could make a four with the three and the one. I could activate two teams individually, or a squad individually. If I had two senior leaders, I could make a four with the two and two ones. So I have two fours. Uh, I could activate two squads. Three, I mean, this, this is a really good versatile roll here. Uh, these guys, they have one senior leader and two junior leaders. So I'm going to make a... They don't have a lot of stuff to do. They're pretty much not going to move. They're just going to stay here the whole game. But uh, I still in a roll for them. So senior leader or a section with a three. And then I got one left over. So the senior leader by himself could order both squads to fire. The senior leader could take a shock off of the Brent since he is attached to them within four inches. Um, and... If you are attached to a squad, which means a leader is within four inches of that squad, then he's allowed to take shock off of them, even if they are in sight of the enemy. So that's what I'll do. I'll take a shock off the Bren, and then I'll just order both squads to fire. So the first thing I'll fire at, I'll fire the British section at these guys here. So they're the closest, they're the most obvious threat, but in reality, any of these squads back here I could fire at. Um, this would probably be the least, the uh, squad behind the hard cover would probably be the least uh, advantageous to shoot at because they are in hard cover. So I will just take a shot at the squad in the open but tactical. So British section gets a 12 shot, 6 for the Bren, 6 for the rifles. We are within 18 inches, so we're going to be hitting on 4s. So we've got 3, 4, five hits. Now I'll split those up. Uh, there's no other teams that I in four. Are these guys in four? No. So all the hits are going to go onto this squad. So I'll put uh, two on the machine gun team, three on the rifle team. So they are uh, considered in light cover because they're tactical. So we'll go ahead and roll for them. Ooh, a six. Three is nothing because light cover. So a six is a dead guy. So the machine gun team, another six. So not good. And the two is nothing. So I've lost two men. So the way it works for leaders, if you get hit, is every time you take a kill, you have to roll to see if a leader is hit. And the way that works is you roll, you have to roll uh, equal to or less than the number of total kills. And if it's below that, the leader is hit. In this case, I got two two dead, so on 1d6, I need to roll a 2 or less. If I roll a 2 or less, one of the leaders will be hit. And I do. It's a 1. So one of my leaders is hit. Now, I happen to have two leaders in this group. A junior leader, a squad leader, and a senior leader. So the way we do it is I'll roll another d6 to see which one it is. So on a 1 to 3, the junior leader. On a 4 to 6, it'll be the senior leader. I re-roll that. A one. So the junior leader is hit. Now when a leader is hit, there's various things that can happen to him. He can be killed outright, he can be knocked unconscious, or he can just be lightly wounded, in which case he will lose one of his command initiatives. So now I will roll to see what happens to him. A five. So a five is a light wound. Four, five, six, light wound. A two, three is unconscious, and a one is, is an outright kill. So he will take a light wound, and that would also mean I would have to take a roll on the bad things happen table, which I will do. A 
four. So junior leader wounded on a four is minus one on a force morale. So the force morale is already starting to drop here for the uh, for the Germans. And the British, or the Allies aren't done. We still have the French squad to go. All right, so I just put a little marker here next to this, the junior leader to show that he's down a command initiative. So the French squad is going to get 14 shots. Um, what they can do, so I've got two teams here. Uh, one of them would be firing through the smoke, but he can always target this squad or this team that's out in the open. So I need more smoke out here to actually get the full effect. So I'm not quite there yet, but so this whole squad is going to fire again at these guys. They're all going to focus on here, but I'll still spread the hits around. Uh, you always shoot at the team in the lightest cover or the easiest to hit. So if you have one, if you have a squad and half of it's in hard cover and half of it is in the open, the firing player can choose to place all the hits on the team in the open if he wants. Or he could have the uh, hits split evenly as normal. But usually you're going to want to focus on the guys in the worst amount of cover. So the French will get 14 dice. And they are within 18 as well. I'm quite sure of it. I guess I should check that, but I'm pretty sure. Oh, yeah. So need and force. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hits. That is not good. So we we'll split them up. Three on each. There's one extra one. I'm in light cover, so I'm going to put them on the rifles. So we'll roll the hits on the rifles. It's a dead man. Plus a point of shock, the five. The new team. Oh my god. Three dead. So that is a horrible roll. You never want to roll like that in a real game. This is just a really bad roll. <laughs> so, uh, four hits. That means that on a four or less this time, my leader will be hit. I don't know if I can get it to roll flat. So it is. Another leader hit. So we'll see which one it is. It is the senior leader this time. And we'll see what happens to him. He's knocked unconscious. So senior leader, knocked out. I lost four men, so I'll take uh, one, two out of the machine gun. So he's down to one man. And then two out of the rifles. So this squad is already, well, basically done for the game. I didn't get enough fire onto the allies uh, to start with, but this is a test, so it's not, uh, we're not in a game or anything. So we'll just continue on. That's it for the uh, for the allies. Now we'll go back to the German phase. All right, so <laughs> this fourth squad here is already messed up. So what we're going to do is we'll just roll the, chain command, the command dice for the Germans, and we wind up with a five, which is chain command point, a four, two twos, and a one. So... There's no point in making another four because my senior leader is unconscious. He cannot do anything. This senior leader could do something. And I have a two and a two twos and a one left. So I'll probably activate this squad here to fire. The senior leader will activate all these to fire. And then with the two, I will try to fire at uh, this squad here. All right, so we'll start over here with this squad. We're just going to fire straight ahead at the uh, British section with everything. So they got a, a belt-fed machine gun for eight shots and six riflemen. So 14 shots within 18, so needing fours. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine hits, which is very good. So everything's going to go on to this uh, British section here. So they are in light cover. First, first thing I'll do is I'll split them up evenly. And then I got one extra, which the British player can choose to where it goes. So he'll put it on to the rifle team. So here we go. Uh, nothing much, just a point of shock. All these are nothing. And then the Bren team. We got two points of shock, the five and the four. So <laughs> not highly effective. So two points of shock on the brand and only one point of shock on the rifle team. So the next thing we'll do is we'll fire the machine gun. 
So the machine gun is just going to fire through the gap at the uh, British again. So they're getting 10 shots. And they were within 24, so I need them for us. Ooh. That is a really good roll there. So we had two, four, six, seven hits. So first thing you do is you split them up evenly again. And the odd hit player in cover can produce. So put them back on the rifles. Go for the rifle, so a dead. And two shock. Soft cover, four plus, four five is a shot. And then the Bren team, two dead. So that was an effective round of shooting from the MG42, or 34 in this case. So we have three sixes, which means three dead, which means I roll a D6 for the leader. So I do have my senior leader in that squad, so there's a chance he can be hit. So on a three or less, one of the leaders will be hit. It is a one, so it is one of the leaders. See which one it is. It is the uh, junior leader. See what happens to him. A two, he is knocked unconscious. So the Scottish junior leader is knocked out. One of the kills actually is the leader, so you don't lose that man. Uh, I guess you should probably specify before, but we'll just take uh, one of the kills out of the brand and make that the leader. So we wound up losing one man per team and a wounded junior leader, which we would have to take a morale check on. Or a force morale check, a bad thing. A five would be a minus one. Uh, junior leader wounded on a one or two, it's nothing. So there's in the force morale bad things, you can get uh, zeros and not have any effect. Junior leader lightly wounded on a one or two, the men don't even seem to care about that. So that was it for uh, the machine gun. Now we'll fire the two inch mortar and we'll just keep trying to pour it on them. Actually, I need to get some fire onto that French squad because they're untouched. So got one hit with the light mortar and see what happens to them there in the open a six so a dead man and we'll put that on the rifles now we got to roll to see if it's the leader so on a one it's the leader it is not the leader that time so just one dead rifleman the last thing we have is this squad with the two so with the two you can activate a squad to move or shoot so that's what we're going to do I can't shoot through here because I can't shoot through my own men, but I can get two inches past this guy to see the French squad, but I'm seeing them through the smoke. So that smoke grenade turned out to backfire on me because now it's going to affect my shooting. So it adds a minus one to hit. So we're in, we're, uh, in long range. So we're over 18 inches to the target, so we need a five or a six to hit. But the smoke grenade adds another minus one. So now I'm only going to be hitting on sixes. So they're, that's, well, that's going to be effectiveness of the uh, shooting, obviously, to throw some smoke grenades. So let's see if I get any sixes. I do, I get three of them. So we'll put those on the French squad. So we'll put uh, one each, and then the odd one uh, we'll just put onto the riflemen, or the uh, machine gun team, since they have more men. So that's a point of shock because of the five and the soft cover, and then the rifles. Nothing. So just a point of shock on the um, French squad. Now we will move on to the Allied phases. Ooh, that is a double phase. So three sixes is a double phase, but it's also the end of the turn. But the end of the turn means that various things happen. So if there was a barrage going, the barrage would end, unless you used a chain of command dice to keep it going. Uh, these tactical markers will go away. Any markers you have, tactical, overwatch, will go away at the end of the turn. Also the smoke, any smoke on the board, will go away as well when the turn ends. So, not a good thing for this squad. Because they're already hurting and they're about to get, well, probably wiped out. So what we're left with is a 4 and a 2. So obviously I'll use the 4 on the leader, the senior leader, and then the 2, I could still use that. So with the four, I could take off two shock here um, with two of his commands. And then I could take off a third shock here. So that's the senior leader. That's all he can do. With the two, I could order one of these squads to just fire. 
and knowing that I get the next phase, I'll get to fire again. So we'll go ahead and just fire uh, with the, uh, the British squad here. So even though the leader is knocked out, the two actually activates the section itself, not the leader. So they can still activate without a leader on a two. So I'm getting 11 shots uh, with what's left of the British uh, section. So instead of pouring it on these guys again, which I'm going to get to do next time with even more effect because they'll lose the tactical due to turn ending, I'm going to put some fire onto this uh, um, MG42 crew over here. So and they are over 18, so they need fives and sixes. So I got uh, well, only three hits. So you can see being long range, I lost three hits, which would have been hits on these fours if I was within 18. But, so over here now, I can do some splitting up of the hits. So, I got a machine gun team and a two inch mortar. So I can put one on each, and I'll put one more onto the machine gun team, because I get to choose because I'm in cover, and they have more men, and that's just a better way to do it. So we'll roll for the uh, two in, or the Five semi mortar, oh it's a dead, and then machine gun team, another dead. So the senior leader is attached to both of these guys, he's within four of them. So he's within four, he's attached to them. So I got two kills, so if I have two or less, this, junior, this senior leader is going to be hit, which it is not thankfully. So I just lose one man from each of these teams. And that is it for the first of the double phases for the Scottish section. So we'll move on to the next phase, which is actually in the next turn. So on top of smoke clearing and any kind of status markers you have, another, another thing that happens when the turn ends is any leaders that are wounded get back up. So I got my senior leader back, and this junior leader in the uh, British section is getting, has gotten back up as well. So we'll move on to the allied phase. So two fives, those are, that would be two more chain of command points. Two threes and a two. So I can't activate the senior leader, but with the two threes I can activate each squad individually. So the first thing I'll do is I'll have the British section fire at these guys. So these guys are now sitting ducks. They were tactical, they did have a little bit of smoke protecting them a little bit. Now they got none of that. Um, so they're going to take a full barrage of shooting should the allied commander decide to do that which would be a good idea because the more hits you put, the more likely you are to break a team or wipe a team out or a section. So just fire the British section at these guys in the open. So real quick, another thing you do, if you had a chain of command dice, you can do an interrupt. So one of the things you can do with an interrupt is, uh, well, interrupt an enemy action. So you could interrupt and fire on them, you could move. So if there was some building or something here, I could interrupt and run around in the building and try to get out of line of sight so I wouldn't get blasted. Uh, you could always interrupt and just go tactical. So I could say, I'm going to interrupt and these guys are going to move tactically back or just go tactical wherever they are, which they'll hit the deck, seek cover, and hope to survive the barrage. But we're not going to do that because we're not keeping track of chain command dice right now. So we're just going to shoot. They are within 18. So we got. A pretty decent roll. Six hits. So I have to split those up evenly. Like that. Uh, this this team here is down to one man. Uh, one of the things a junior leader can do, I believe a senior leader as well, uh, with one of his commands, he could actually rearrange the squad. So because the gun's down to one man, they're actually going to lose, I believe it's three on their firepower dice. So instead of five, they're down to three because the gunner is having to do everything on his, on his own now. Reload, change barrels. It slows down his rate of fire. Uh, but as I was saying, one of the things that a leader can do, he could actually order a man from the rifle team to join the machine gun team, bringing it back up to two men. You can't do that on an interrupt. I'd have to do that on my turn. So I'm not going to be able to do that now. But we'll just roll to see the, the results. So I'm now in the open. And in the open, fives are kills and four would be a shock so that team is wiped out over here we got two ones which is nothing and another kill 
So we got three kills. Roll for the leader. It's not, thankfully. But this team is wiped out. That means the machine gun is gone. And I would roll a bad thing for team wiped out. And then we lost a rifleman as well. So there was the British section with the three. The French section can now take their turn. So they're getting six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen shots. And they are also within eighteen. So they get to hit on fours, which not as good that time. Only three hits, which is well, it's good for the Germans. So three hits, one each. Since the men are in the open, the firing unit gets to pick what, uh, well, I guess we only got one team left, so they're all three going to go on to the rifles. But if there was two teams, since they're in the open, the firing unit would get to pick where the odd dice landed. So we roll there. It's another kill, because in the open, fives and sixes are kills. So again, we roll for the leader. It is not the leader. Just another dead German. And that is it for the British phase, and move on to the German phase. All right, so the German phase. I don't know how much longer I'll keep going, but I just want to cut. There's a couple more things we'll show here. So the Germans will get a phase now. So a five, chain of command point, a four, two fours, which is good. I have two senior leaders, and then a one and a two, which I can make into a three uh, to activate a squad. I could use a two to activate a squad and use the one to activate the mortar or the machine gun. Uh, which is handy if you have shock to take off and you want to not activate the squad with the leader, senior leader, and you want to use all his command issues to remove shock, then a one could come in handy for a team such as this. But in this case, we'll, uh, we'll give one of these to him. Give one of these to him. And there's no other option. That's all that we can do with him. And I got a two and a one left. So what we'll do with the first four is activate the platoon sergeant. So surprisingly, I have no shock. I've been rolling all sixes, so I've been losing men like crazy, but I haven't really accumulated a lot of shock. I was kind of hoping to, so that I could show you what, what would happen when they pin and when they break, but, uh, well, it is what it is. So what we're going to do here is we're going to try to get out of here. So we're going to have the senior leader throw two smoke grenades, and we're going to throw both of them towards the French. So I want to get them as far as I can. So the first guy I'll throw, nine. So that'll land about there. And the second guy, I'll try to just get it right next to it with an eight, which he does. So there we have it. We now have a smoke screen, which will make it harder for the French to hit. The British obviously can still hit, but you can only throw so many smoke grenades. If he has one command initiative left, I'm going to order them to move back tactically. Or I could run them over here, which might be a better idea. That's what I'll do. So I'll uh, move these guys. So we're going to go over this wall. It's not obviously the most uh, intelligent move, but I want to show going over a low wall like this. So versus going over a high hedge, a low obstacle, you roll 2d6 and remove the lowest dice. Now you can't move over um, walls and obstacles with 1d6, obviously. You have to roll 2 which means you cannot fire at all when you go over an obstacle. Because the only way to move and fire would be to roll 1d6 and fire at half effect. But if you can't roll 1d6 to go over an obstacle, obviously you can't do that. So to get over the wall, I would have to roll 2d6 and remove the lowest instead of the highest as it is with the high obstacle. So these guys actually move up 6 inches, which again, probably not the wisest move. I could stay here and shoot, but I want to get these guys moving. I want to show how to get over a low wall like that. So that's a three. Now I could throw another smoke grenade, or I could throw a regular grenade. I got one command left. So the first command was to order them to move. Now I got one left. I could say I want to throw a hand grenade over the hedge onto the British, which I will do. So again, as like the smoke grenades, he has as many frag grenades as he has command initiatives. Uh, we only have one left so we can throw one. So the way that works, you have to be more than four inches from the target, unless the target is in 
um, hard cover, as in your throwing unit is safe from the blast. They're throwing it around a corner, they're throwing it through a slit in a uh, bunker, something like that. But in a case like this, you would have to be more than four inches from the target, which we are. So what you do is you roll 2d6. You find out what the distance to the target is, and eight. So on 2d6, I have to roll eight or more for the grenade to hit. Uh, six does not hit. So when it doesn't hit, it just lands over here, blows up ineffectively, it's a dud. Who, who knows what really happened to it, but it doesn't do anything to anybody. But just for the sake of the video, we'll say we got an eight. So the way grenades work is, so with a grenade, if they're in the open or light cover like they are here, I'll get two hits. So that grenade hit would be two hits. They are within four of each other, so they would each take one. And uh, that's that. So the first squad, or first team is nothing. Second team is a dead. So again, you'd have to roll for a leader. It's not. But another dead uh, Frenchman in the, uh, I'm sorry, another dead Scottish guy. So now the Bren team is now down to one man. And when a magazine-fed machine gun is down to one man, they lose two on their firepower dice. So some of the other rules for grenades, um, there's some modifiers, so you have to roll over the uh, distance, I believe it's, uh, yeah, over, not equal to or over, I'm not sure about that, but uh, so on that roll it would be minus two if you were trying to throw it through a door or a window of a building, minus four on your 2d6 roll if the target is an upstairs window or an open top vehicle. So you can throw grenades in vehicles, but it's hard to land them in there. And then if you're trying to get in and throw it into a vision slit of a bunker or into an open tank turret, it's a minus six. So, I mean, you got to be literally almost right next to the thing in order to get it through a bunker vision slit or into a tank hatch. If you do happen to land it inside a bunker or an enclosed space like inside of a building, then you would actually get three hits and it would ignore the effects of cover. So in this case, they still got the light cover. But if you throw a grenade in a room, a small room with some guys, it's going to do a lot of damage. So you get one more hit and you ignore cover. So that's the way grenades work. So, But now these guys are out in the open, but that's all right. We could have also thrown a smoke grenade, but we, tried, we chose to do the frag. So now what I'll do is I'll move these guys. I'm, I'm actually going to instead run them over to this hard cover instead of moving tactically because I think that's a better idea. So I'm going to roll 3d6 and hope I make it over here. And I will also take a shock uh, for the team for running. So I got, what, nine? So I believe that will get me in the hard cover. So this squad is now a lot better off. Um, they were ticked. They were going to be sitting ducks. I would have to roll bad things when the squad got wiped out. I got two leaders, so this this was a lot of bad things happen, waiting to happen right here. So it was good to get them out of here and then move those guys up. So I still actually have this whole squad here. Or not squad, but I got uh, this senior leader commanding the machine gun and too much mortar left. So my senior leader has three command initiatives, right? So he can actually do machine gun for the machine gun because it takes two or more command initiatives to activate machine gun and he would get that many more shots. So the machine gun will now get 12 shots instead of 10. And with his, I could add a third shot with another command initiative, but instead I'm going to use my last command to activate the, the uh, five centimeter mortar. So first thing we'll do is we'll just fire on these British uh, with these guys. Uh, I'm not going to shoot through the smoke. I would need probably sixes to do that, maybe fives or sixes, but we'll just fire on these guys again. So I know we're in range here, so a very good machine gun roll there. So this machine gun's really, uh, really tearing it up. So that's eight hits, so it's four each, so the rifles, that's a dead and a shock. And one guy left in the running team, he's dead. So again, we roll for the leader, it is the leader. Roll to see which one, four plus is the senior, no, nope. junior leader's hit again. See what happens to him? He's knocked unconscious again. So when you, uh, junior leaders, or any leader, and for that matter, is um, when they're, say he gets wounded and he loses a command initiative. Uh, they can lose command initiatives 
until they get to zero. When they get to zero, they die. Um, when you get hit and wounded and knocked out, that is not losing a command initiative. So technically, if you can get knocked out as many times in the game as, as you can and not die, you still got a real bad thing for being wounded, but you don't die. So, but the downside obviously is he can't do anything when he's knocked out. Uh, medics in this game are very good because what they do is they can spend a phase healing a, medic, uh, a leader. So if he's knocked out, the medic will get him back up. If he's minus one on his command initiative, he can restore that command initiative. And he can only do that once per leader per game. Uh, and, and medics can activate actually on any dice. So if you got a wasted four, if you have a medic, you can use that four to move the medic. And medics ignore cover, they move individually. And, but they're very handy. You can move them on any, any command dice and they can bring leaders, uh, wake them up or restore their lost uh, command initiative, which is very good. So one support point for a medic, it's well worth taking, I think. I usually try to bring one if I have an extra point uh, because I've had good luck with them in the past. So the last thing we'll do is fire this uh, five centimeter mortar. I don't even know if I did that or not, but uh, one hit. So the Bren team is actually gone. Actually, I think I had two hits. I'll take it out of the rifle, leave the Bren. And then, uh, yeah, I'll put it on. So there's the Bren dead. Okay. He was meant to be dead. So I'd roll a bad thing for team wiped out. I would have to roll leaders again, which it would be again. And it would be the senior. And he would be minus one on his command initiative. So that's where the medic would come in handy. And that is everything that the Germans can do. All right, so at this point, I think I'll stop the video now. Uh, I think I've shown enough different tactics. Uh, there's one tactic I didn't show, uh, but that I wanted to, and that's covering fire. So covering fire, the way it works is we would declare that I'm, I'm going to do covering fire. So each team would have to be ordered to do it separately. Or I guess you could order the whole squad to fire to do covering fire with one command. But if you wanted to do covering fire in two different teams, then you would have to do two different orders. But let's say I want to do covering fire from this squad onto the French squad. So I would say I'm going to do covering fire. So what covering fire does, it adds another minus one modifier to hit for the uh, firing target. So each covering, each team can cover a four inch frontage with its covering fire. So if the teams, if the squad or team is bunched up, it may only take one um, covering fire to, to, to give them the negative one. If they're a whole squad spread out, then obviously you're going to need to use two uh, teams to get a nine inch covering fire. So covering fire, like I said, just is, it gives a minus one to hit. And that's cumulative too. So if you have smoke in between and covering fire, you know, there's a chance at long range that these French squad couldn't hit my German squad out in the open at all because they would need sevens. Fives or sixes for long range. And a minus one for the smoke grenade. And another minus one for the covering fire, which would equal a seven, which is obviously impossible on the D6. So that's the last, I believe the last tactic I can think of um, rules wise and game wise but overall I mean you want to do fire and movement so you want to lay down fire with the base fire element like a squad and you can have one squad doing covering fire you can have another squad advancing throwing smoke you can have mortars and machine gun providing covering fire or just shooting um, sometimes if you have a clear superiority and firepower you're better off just sit, sitting back and blasting away. Um, obviously, a lot of different variables go into that decision. Uh, there's a lot, usually in a real game, you're going to have more squads, you're going to have more support out there, you're going to have hard cover. Uh, there's a lot of variables involved that make the textbook way to do infantry tactics uh, not always possible or not work at all in this game. So you have to be flexible. Uh, this is kind of a romanticized way of looking at it with you know clear lines of fire no enemies coming around the flanks you can do covering fire throw smoke but uh even then you saw what happened to these guys down here they uh they got tore up pretty bad out in the open the double phases are a big part of that uh, i could have done more with the german double phase uh, but it all comes down to the dice rolls if you don't get what you need then there's nothing you can do 
So you got to be flexible. You have to be ready to take advantage of situations, obviously, and make the most of every double phase you get. As I was editing this video, I realized I never went over close combat, and that's something I really wanted to cover in this video since it's an infantry video. So I want to go over close combat and how that works. So I've reset this. I brought the entire Ger or French or sorry Scottish section back, and I put a fresh uh, German section out. So the way close combat works is, as soon as you get within four inches of an enemy unit, close combat is initiated. So if you don't want to be in close combat, don't get within four inches of the enemy because you have no choice at that point. So in the rule book, there's a chart for close combat. And the way it works is you start at the top of the chart and you work your way down. And you do what it tells you to do in each step. So the first step is you get 1d6 per man, not including leaders. So this squad would get uh, 10. I'm just going to mix all my dice together here because this takes a lot of dice. So we got 10 just for the men. And then the uh, British section will get 10 as well. Now, you're going to find out real quick that this is a bad way to assault. You never want to assault an enemy in cover with machine guns that aren't pinned or highly shocked. And you'll see why in a second as the British dice start to pile up. So the next one on the list is per leader command. I'm sorry, correction. It's not, the leader does not count in this. So they actually get nine because they have nine men plus a leader. The leader gets his own dice. And that comes in the next step. Uh, per leader command initiative, you get two more. So these are both junior leaders. So they both get two dice. Next step, per troop quality level higher. Uh, these troops are the same. They're both regulars. But if one was a... Uh, um, elite and the other one was regular, they would get uh, another 2d6 uh, per troop quality level higher. So if we had elites versus green, they would get 4d6 because they're two, two levels higher. Uh, okay, so the next one, uh, per d6 enemy moved. So I need to move into uh, range here. So what is that? I need to get within four inches, so I need to get there, which means I need to move five inches. So you want to move as little as possible, obviously, because the more dice you move, the more dice the defender gets. So um, every D6 I move, the enemy would get one more. So I'm going to move two D6 just to make sure I get there. So the British will get two more dice. Uh, next is per two points of shock, you minus one dice. So every two points of shock you had in the squad, you would take uh, one dice out for each two points. Neither of these squads has any shock, so that doesn't work. Uh, aggressive troops, neither are aggressive. Aggressive is a rule that certain platoons have that are listed in their uh, platoon entry. And that would be one D6 for every three men. So every three guys in the squad, you get another D6 for them. Uh, next is per SMG. So we have one SMG per squad. Each squad leader has one. So each SMG gets two more dice. After that is per LMG first round. So that only that only pertains to the defender, not the attacker. So we do have an LMG here, the brain gun. So he gets four dice for that. Next on the list for MMG, we don't have one of those. That'd be six dice. So you definitely don't want to be charging one of those head on. Okay, next is defending light cover or inside building, defending from another floor. So we are in light cover here. That means I get plus 1d6 for every three dice. So every three dice, I get another d6 for. So I got one, two, three, four, five, six. So that is six more dice for the British. So you can see the pile is starting to get a little unbalanced here. And heavy cover we get, actually give you plus 1d6 for every two dice. And then finally at the end of the list, hit and rear, first round, you remove half dice. So if you really want to reduce the number of dice, if you can get behind someone and assault them, you remove half their dice immediately. And then finally the last thing on the list is if the enemy unit is pinned, you reduce by half again. So if you're hitting them in the uh, pin enemy unit from the rear, then you would remove half and remove half again. If they're only pinned and you're not hitting from the rear, then you would just remove half. 
So that is how you calculate the number of dice that you get in close combat. So let's just see what we got here. Three, six, nine, twelve, thirteen dice for the Germans. And four, eight, twelve, sixteen, twenty, four, twenty-five dice for the British. So obviously this is a suicide mission for the for the Germans. Um, they're like almost double the amount of dice the or they're half the amount of dice almost that they're the defenders getting so yeah not this is not an ideal situation obviously you're going to want to have these guys pinned you're going to want to have them whittled down uh, hit them from behind if possible this is definitely not an ideal situation but i just wanted to show how the dice are um, calculated how many you get so um obviously this is a very unbalanced mission but we're going to go ahead with it anyway so Next thing you do is you roll all the dice. So close combat effects, a five is a kill, each five is one kill, each six is one kill plus one shock. And you want to keep track of how many you get. So first we'll just roll the British dice here. Tons of them. So we got, uh, wow, that's a lot of sixes. <laughs> I think that's all she wrote for the uh, German squad. So it was a very good roll uh, for the British, but the Germans get their roll too, and they only get, uh, <laughs> yeah, horrible. That was a, well, it's, just, it's a bad example, but basically we lost the entire squad and the British lost two men and took two shock. Every single one of these sixes would have been a shock, so let's just say we lost by... We'll say the British got uh, five, and the Germans got two. I mean, I'm sorry, the British got two, and the Germans, you know what I mean. British got five, the Germans got two. So the Germans got two sixes, that means two men are killed, and you do roll for leaders, the same. So it's not the leader, so just two men are dead, and each six means a dead plus one shock, so they take two shock. So the Germans, on the other hand, would lose five men and take four points of shock. So we'll see if it's a leader. So on a five or less, it's the leader. So there's obviously a good chance of the leader getting hit in close combat when you take that many casualties. He is the leader, and he loses a command initiative, which is a bad thing. And the five, four shock on top of that. Actually, you're supposed to break them down by team like you wouldn't shooting, but I didn't do that. So we'll just take out uh, five dudes. So there's that. So now you go to the uh, results of close combat. So a draw, which means you get the same amount of kills each, you would fight again immediately unless one side breaks due to shock. Um, you can do that a maximum of three times and then you retire three inches. So you keep fighting over and over Eventually you'll just get too tired and both sides will, will fall back three inches. That doesn't ever happen usually. Uh, if you lose by one, the team would fall back six inches. If you lose by two, the team would fall back nine inches and take one shock per team. If you lose by three, which is the case here, you would fall back, flee, I'm sorry, flee 12 inches and gain two per team. So when you flee, you flee and you face the other way. So the rifle team and the leader. So they had six shock on them. So one, two, three, four, five, six, which was almost pinned. But when they flee, and after a loss by three, they take two more shock per team. So now we're up to 10 shock with one, two, three, four, five, six guys. So they're pinned now. They're not uh, broken yet because they have to have double the shock as men. So they'd have to have 12 shock in order to break them. But another squad, such as that French squad now, could finish the job of breaking them and they would run off. So that is how um, close combat works. Again, not an ideal way to do it. Um, you need a lot more setup. You need to pin them, get a lot of shock on them, kill a few guys, and then 
if they're behind cover, try to get around them. It's it's not easy to do. Um, this obvious, this obviously was not a good way to do it, but it did show off the uh, mechanics of close combat. So that's that. I just wanted to get that in there. So it's in there. So that'll do it for this video. Uh, hopefully it's helpful. Um, the last one was well received, so I think maybe this one will be as well. Uh, this is. I'm, I'm sure I probably missed some infantry things in here. I thought I tried to cover most everything. Grenades, smoke grenades, covering fire, tactical movement, movement over high obstacles, movement over low obstacles, leader hits, morale. Uh, I think I covered, if not all of it, then a good, most, a good 90% of it. So if I forgot anything, um, just let me know. And I can also, I'm also going to plan on doing more of these videos. I don't know any more on the infantry. I might do some on vehicles. Vehicle rules in this game are really good. They're per probably my favorite uh, tank um, armored vehicle rules that I've played for a World War II game. But uh, anyway, yeah, so uh, don't forget to check out the Tabletop CP Facebook group. Uh, check out the Tabletop CP Patreon page if you want to help out uh, make better videos like this. And uh, Stay tuned for the next uh, video series that I'm going to do, which will probably be armored vehicles. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.